Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. Joining me in the Captains of Industry hot seat is Sizueng Lasana. He is the CEO of the First Rand Group. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You took over as CEO in 2006 from Paul Harris at the First Rand Bank. Yeah, and then at the group in 2010, January. So you've only been at the helm effectively for three years, which according to yourself, you shouldn't be in a top job for longer than 10 years. So yes. you've still got seven years left at First Rand. Uh, yeah, if everything's still going well, yes. A fair deduction. Let's move on to the current banking environment and what do you think is happening in the South African space? Obviously, First Rand and FNB in particular is doing incredibly well at the moment. Traction across the board, having won awards. I think the, the most innovative bank in the world is the last accolade. Where are we going right now, Sizwe? Well, clearly the banks are about whether what happens in the economy. And therefore, the South African banks would be a proxy of the economic growth that we see in the country. And to the extent that there is a slowdown, which we have, uh, we have been experiencing in the economy in South Africa, means that you're going to see that show through in terms of uh, activity in the banking environment, whether it is lending activity, transactional activity, or even you know people investing uh, through the banking platforms and so on. Uh, we see all that happening in, in our space. Uh, clearly, there are pockets where certain sectors are growing. Uh, for instance, the retail sector in certain areas still continues to grow. Uh, but there are also areas where we've seen slowdown in terms of growth. I recently chatted to Mike Brown, the CEO of Nedbank, and asked him what he deemed to be the most challenging element of his job at the moment. And he clearly threw forward to the uncertainty in the macroeconomic environment globally. Is that a concern for you, taking into account what you've just said? Well, it is a concern, but you know, it's not something that I honestly lose sleep over uh, because you know, it's what it is. And I think we have to look at opportunities in the context of uncertainty. I think business always operates in an uncertain environment. Okay. Looking at the 2012 year, 90% of your profits come from South Africa. Mm. You're not taking advantage of the Africa opportunity. I, I know you've got a foray into the likes of Namibia, Mozambique, Tanzania, to name just a few, and then you are investigating Ghana and Nigeria, a greenfields operation. But 90% of your profits from South Africa. Yes, it is correct. And, and clearly what we've done is to take a very long-term view of the investments that we're making in the continent. And, and clearly, we are part of Africa, and South Africa is still a very important component of our business. And therefore, to the extent that we continue to grow in this country, clearly off a very large base, means that uh, it's going to take us quite a while before we can see a significant increase in the contribution that comes from activities that are outside of South Africa. And it's also important to recognize that as we invest, Clearly, we're at a stage where we're not necessarily generating profits in some of the newer countries where we've invested, five of them particularly, Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania, Ghana, as well as Nigeria, uh, which means you know, we're not getting returns, we're, we're planting and, and, and really getting ready to set ourselves up and to bark up and become seeded players in those countries. And uh, we take a very long-term view, and in fact, you know, the benefits that will flow from those investments is not something that's going to happen now, especially given our, our approach in investment. And your approach in investment appears to be one that does not embrace acquisitive growth. You would much rather go the organic route. Is that fair? It is fair in markets where it is appropriate to do so. However, we do make acquisitions uh, in, in certain markets where it doesn't necessarily make sense to go organic. However, even if we do so, Typically, we are not unlikely as a group to make large acquisitions because, you know, we are a group that is highly focused on return on equity as well as just making sure that we don't overpay for whatever assets we acquire. And therefore, in that regard, it, it really sort of gets us into a space where if we make acquisitions, they are typically going to be, you know, smaller to medium-sized ones. I just want to focus on your, your Nigerian venture at the moment, an investment bank in that space. You're setting it up at the grassroots level, now having traveled the continent ex uh, extensively of late. One of the key themes I've seen unrolling out of West Africa is that you need to JV, you need to partner, but you don't see that as necessary in your operation in Nigeria? Well, partnerships, it takes 
different forms. In any country in which you operate, we do believe very much in having local participation, whether it's in terms of management or it is in terms of our governance structures, the board and so on, because that does give us a lot of insight in terms of you know, the nuances or differences or challenges and opportunities in any particular market. So we see partnerships in that, in that sense. Uh, clearly, as a bank, especially given the regulatory environment, the capital requirements and so on, it is always important that you know, we have uh, control of the operations in which we are invested. And, and therefore, we'll have partnerships. We have partnerships, in fact, in almost all countries in which we have operations. We have partnerships in India, we have partnerships in Namibia, we have partnerships elsewhere as well. So <clears throat> we do embrace the spirit of partnership, but however, it's a different form of partnerships, especially when you have startup businesses uh, and you're not making any returns. It typically is quite difficult to actually get partners on board because you have to invest, you have to introduce capital, which means if you have partners that may not be in a position to introduce capital, they're going to dilute and so on. So and of course, if you did go the acquisitive route, mm. then you'd also dilute or have a negative impact on your return on equity, which is a, a key measure yeah, on absolutely. your front. 2012 coming in at 20.7. That's in the band that you've stipulated that 18 to 22. Yes. In fact, it's at the higher end of the band. Mm. The question out there on most analysts' slips is whether you can maintain that ROE. We are quite confident we can maintain the 18 to 22 range, uh, and that includes the capital clearly that we're investing in new operations, so we're quite comfortable with that. Loyalty programs. Now, FNB certainly seems to be leading the charge on that front, and, and again, I refer to your 2012 financial results, where you paid out some half a billion rand over the year, mm. and that was in e-bucks. That's phenomenal. It is, absolutely. You know, this has been a long time coming. So eBucks did not just grow and become a success in terms of the rewards program that it is today. Uh, and the concept that we've really been driving throughout the group, not just in FNB, in West Bank as well as in RMB, is one of a clear value proposition to our customers. In other words, uh, we may not necessarily be the cheapest, but we want to offer a value proposition in terms of all the products that, and the services that we give to our customers that are appealing, that are effective, that are cost effective, but also that work. On that same point, fuel rewards, you pay out about 11 million rand on a monthly basis. A significant uptake from consumers for the fuel re rewards program. Do you think that's going to continue to grow? It is going to continue to grow. I mean, we all know the cost of fuel as the oil prices continue to go up uh, is an important cost factor in people's lives. But it's not just the fuel rewards program that is quite successful. In the lower end of the market, we introduce the airtime rewards where for people who don't necessarily have a car, they need to have something which is an incentive. And we came up with this concept of rewarding them through uh, prepaid airtime. And it's been particularly successful as well. You've been driving aggressively into the lower end of the market, the, the mass market. And uh, of course, there's much debate around the unsecured lending potential bubble and whether that's about to, to burst. I see you've been quoted before as saying that the mass market is not only your lower LSM, but it also includes many players in the, the middle tier of the market. Yeah, that's absolutely in, important because you know, the way that we've looked at, at unsecured lending uh, is that you know, there, is, there are opportunities in unsecured lending. Uh, clearly, if we look at the mass market, the lower end of the market, uh, we do believe that market is becoming a little bit overtraded and in fact is uh, even facing some stresses in certain respects in terms of impairments and bad debts. Uh, however, we see opportunities in the middle income market. Uh, but even there, you know, if you look at just the general level of indebtedness that is out there, uh, we have taken a more judicious, a more uh, cautious approach in terms of how we're landing in, in that space. You operate generally in what many would say is a commoditized environment. If you look at the vehicle lending space, the home lending space, again, you talk about the loyalty programs that you put forward for your customers, but it's going to be difficult to keep ahead of the pack, keep innovating, make sure you create that stickiness with very commoditized products across your customer base. We don't believe it's difficult. You know, it really has to be something that one looks at in the context of our DNA, the culture that exists in the group. Uh, we have a whole range of innovations that are coming down the line. And therefore, we believe that we can continue actually to create a value proposition. And you know, yes, some products may be commoditized, but it's how you look at those products 
and you, you, whether or not you accept that you have a commoditized product. And that's where innovation comes in, because you know you can take a motor vehicle loan and you can really make it very interesting. You can create a value chain, you know, as well as an ecosystem that is able to attract and retain customers in a way that's very different from how customers would do it. And, but it has to, to start with the culture that you embed in the organization. Some would say that FNB has embarked on a relatively aggressive marketing campaign. Are you seeing that translating into customer numbers? Absolutely. I mean, we posted the 1.3 million growth in customers as of the last year end, and we continue to see an increase in customer numbers. And it's not just uh, marketing. You know, marketing has to be supported by products that are appealing, products that work, uh, where customers experience exactly what we say in terms of our marketing campaigns, and we see that across the board. So there has to be something behind advertising, otherwise it is hollow. Again, you've been quoted as saying that there's a tsunami of regulation coming your way. Are you going to find that, that territory difficult to navigate? It is difficult to navigate. I mean, we continue to see it. And it's not just banking regulations. It is, for instance, we have Twin Peaks coming down the line in this country. We have the National Credit Regulator. We have other regulations, for instance, in, in the environment, um, in the environment as well as sustainability area. And, and therefore, the cost of doing business is going up. Clearly, uh, we have to embrace these regulations. We have to find other ways to make our businesses more efficient, to take costs out of the business, uh, so that at the end of the day, the return to our shareholders can be sustained. Since where First Rand has exposure on the corporate side to both the mining and the platinum sector specifically. Obviously, we know that that arena has been hard hit. What impact is it going to have on the First Rand group? Uh, the exposure that we have in the mining sector and commodity sector is typically the investment grade counters. So those companies clearly are also feeling uh, the pressure because of the labor unrest that we've seen in the mining sector. However, you know, these are solid companies and therefore in terms of, you know, potential losses that we may have, we don't think that's a major issue in our lives.